What an excellent day for an exorcism. Podcast. I am your host, Colin Peters. John Rochetter. <laughs> Jeff Manfred. Uh, just got here. <laughs> that is Greg Mole, but we call him Newport. <laughs> Old I wonder, man. I wonder why. <laughs> Today we have a very special guest with us. He comes from Scotland or many, many other places. <laughs> Scotland and Ireland primarily. Yes. Okay. <laughs> He is a lord of the night, amongst many other things. Ladies and gentlemen, our one and only vampire, Lord Damien McDonovan. Lord Damien, thank you very much. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Colin. Colin, it's, it's been, a, been a while since I actually got to see you. It has. And, yeah. and some of the other guys at the table, too. It's, we, we've known each other for quite some time, but I think this is the first time in a while we've all been in the same room. Yes. Uh, so, Lord Damien, please tell us about yourself for our listeners. All right, well, let's see where to start with a 337-year-old history. Um, I was born in Scotland, I uh, became a pirate and went to Ireland, tried to regain my family's history and honor and wealth and ended up becoming a vampire instead. So I've been here in the States for about 300 years now and I have recently taken it upon myself to make a living as a horror host, a la Elvira and Sven Gulli and the like. So I actually have a TV show right now, uh, which I also put onto my YouTube channel. The TV show is called Damien's Dreadfuls. Uh, it's on my YouTube page. Uh, a YouTube user is, uh, is Damien McDonovan. And also on Facebook on, under Damien McDonovan and Twitter and Instagram, Lord underscore McDonovan. So you can check me out in all of those places. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here for, for this episode today. All righty. This episode is a special one to have you on because today we are going to be talking about the classic of classic horror movies, The Exorcist, written by uh, William... Peter Blatty. Peter Blatty. And the director, I believe his name is also William? William Friedkin. William Friedkin. I've heard Friedkin or Friedkin, but we've been, <laughs> I've been hearing a lot of Friedkin. Freaking, freaking, huh? Yes. <laughs> freaking sounds right to me. <laughs> so, uh, basically, I guess the way to start is this movie came out in 1973. It took about a year of production and had a long list of issues, to say the least. What, like nine deaths, I think it was? Nine deaths, uh, a burn set that some people say supposedly burned down and then mm-hmm. didn't burn down, but mm-hmm. nobody was there, so yeah. they don't know for sure. Linda Blair, the actress, she had to have bodyguards with her six months after the film released because she had received a lot of death threats from a lot of religious zealots, so that was one thing. True. And both, both Linda and... Uh... And the the mother, uh, Ellen Burstyn. Ellen Burstyn were were injured on set doing doing stunts yeah, on set with both their back. Them. I think both right? both backs in different mm-hmm. areas. Yes. And, uh, and of course, there's a there's allegedly a real serial killer in the movie. Oh, I really? Don't know. Yes. No. Really? I didn't yes. know that either. Yeah. The um. There's a there's a medical technician in the scene where she's uh, she's having tests done in the hospital. Oh yeah. And uh, going for real uh, reality, he he actually had some of the actual hospital technicians there performing the procedure, and the one guy was arrested sometime after the movie came out. Uh, he was actually arraigned and prosecuted and uh, convicted of murder. Oh and God. while he was in prison, there was a whole other slew of evidence coming forward that he may have been linked to the serial killing of a, of a host of gay men in the area. Oh, my God. Wow. That's, Jeez. That's uh, intense. <laughs> <laughs> and despite all that, this movie ended up becoming Warner Brothers' highest grossing movie if you adjust... Inflection, because of course ticket pricing was different back then, but oh, it's still their highest grossing movie of all time. I think it was one of the highest grossing movies in general. Of in all general, time. It's, definitely, yeah. it's definitely the highest grossing horror movie of all yeah. time when adjusted for inflation. But did it break its record when it came out in 2017? I think it may have. I don't think it adjusted for inflation. Okay. Now. Okay. Um, well, just to give our audience, in case if anybody hasn't 
ever seen The Exorcist. There's uh, something wrong with you. It's been out forever. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you're under a rock or whatever. It's, just, it's here. It's probably the most hey, iconic horror movie. Some people are not huge horror fans. <laughs> well, then there's something wrong with them, too. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even have to be a horror fan to enjoy this movie. Like, There's so much in there. It could take your spirituality. You get to see a lot more from different aspects. Agreed. It's not just a horror movie. There, there is yes. a meaning that does go away with it. And mm-hmm. I... I'm not sure if it was Linda Blair or if it was William Peter Blatty who was the one who said that he wanted a takeaway from it and didn't want to make it seem like a, a an evil wins kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he did... Uh, it was either him or Freakin said that they did want a message to it. It wasn't just supposed to be a horror movie. Oh, no, yeah. It's all about redemption, faith. Mm-hmm. A lot of that is prevalent in the movie. Yeah. Very. It's essentially putting your faith to the test. Like It, it is. It definitely with the scene with the two priests at the end fighting the demon was a great aspect of that because mm-hmm. yeah. you ultimately, if you watch the director's cut, you see a lot more of the priest fighting with himself whether or not he wants to take the demon from her and kill himself. It yeah. was pretty much like the ultimate sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And and that actually influenced even just the casting of the movie too. The the the, mm. the goal to put to to put that kind of message in the film influenced the casting. Like uh, Jack Nicholson was actually up for one of the roles, and they insisted that they didn't want him because uh, yes. he, didn't, he didn't come off as holy enough. Right. That, yeah, I, I did come across that. I did. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is it really shocking though to hear Jack Nicholson wasn't holy enough? <laughs> That's just <laughs> real <laughs> shocking. <laughs> for instance. Like, yeah. yeah. Miss Shine would happen years later, but still. <laughs> I mean, I guess they could have replaced Linda Blair with. Jack Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a lot less makeup would be involved. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine him doing the voice, the demon voice? I, I no. think Nicholson could probably turn his head all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, of course, the, the fact that Jack Nicholson was far too unholy in this weekend later, <laughs> later influenced the director of The Witches of Easter to cast yes. him as Satan. <laughs> <laughs> what an excellent day <laughs> for an exorcism. <laughs> Can you imagine and Another that? Warner Brothers movie? So, um, for all our listeners, uh, let's go through the movie. And uh, Lord Damien, do you want to be the one to uh, go through the movie and say your two cents about... <laughs> Well, the do, description of it. Well, do we do we want to start off like scene by scene, or do we just want to do like like a full like like go over to the whole? Ah, film? just like a real quick synopsis interpretation. Uh, um, all right. Well, uh, a quick synopsis is that uh, we well first off we start with uh, with Father Marin uh, questioning his faith after walking through the uh, the archaeological dig site. Played by um, Max von Sydow. Max von yes. S- is it Sydow? Sydow? I, I think Sydow. Sydow? Sydow. 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 I think is the pronunciation Sydow. I've been hearing a lot from people. I've, I've, I've never been quite sure. You know, uh, but um, but he um, he uh, then later is called on after uh, after an exorcism is needed when, uh, when uh, a young girl in... Uh, it's Boston, right? I want to say Georgetown. It's George, Georgetown. Georgetown. Didn't they say Georgetown? It, George, it is in the Washington area. Okay. Washington, Washington DC. Washington, that's yep. right. That's right. Um, uh, becomes uh, be, begins acting strangely, and her mother eventually, who is not, uh, I guess the the family the family in the book I know is not Catholic. Um, I don't remember if they're actually Catholic in the movie. They're not. They're, they're, they're not. not. Okay. No. I don't think there's any sign of religion besides the priest. That like have any influence the, 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 over religion? Like comes in. I think there is just some crucifixes on the wall, but they're more or less for decoration rather than them specifying that they are religious. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the uh, young girl, the young girl becomes possessed, acting e- extremely violently, uh, and uh, eventually the <laughs> priests <Okay>. are uh, <laughs> Father Marin and uh, and a younger priest. Uh, I need a young priest and an old priest. Uh, <laughs> uh, come uh, are are called upon to uh, to attempt to exorcise this demon from from this young girl, and obviously horror ensues until the, until the very end, and then and then further because there's you know, five sequels. Um, <laughs> Was it five? Oh, something. Else. I, 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 I just, didn't know. It, it might I, as well be five. I'm pretty sure that I think there's there's a couple of sequels. There's a couple of prequels. There were two prequels made at the exact same time, oh uh, supposedly same going over story. the exact same story. Yeah, it pretty much. Directions. Was that the one with Tom Wilkinson? I remember that one. The third one was actually really good. That because that told a different story with George C. Scott. Well, the third mm-hmm. one was actually not even supposed to be an Exorcist movie. William Peter Blatty wanted to do. I think he wrote a book called Legion. 
Okay. And he wanted to make that into a movie, and that's what Exorcist 3 originally was, but Warner Brothers had seen it and said, oh, you know, we like this, let's make it. The same author. Same author. Yeah, connected. And and he had even said, we don't even have an Exorcist scene in this movie. So they went back and reshot it and slapped the label on. Slapped the label on, okay. But they said they hated two so much that they were like, why would you even (laughs) want to? Two is an abomination. (laughs) Why would you want to continue? (laughs) It's like, uh, this this franchise, it's like, it had Exorcist and then Exorcist 2. Then you have Jaws, which was nominated for Best Picture. Then you have Jaws 2, which was nowhere near comparison. But Exorcist 2, was even worse off off the rails. I mean, not, let's not even get into that movie. It was a bomb, it's a train wreck. I'd say honestly, the only thing you really get out of uh, Exorcist Two is what the demon's real name is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's, that's it. That and movie. that was even <laughs> in the book. But the fact yeah. is, like, it is the most ridiculous name because you call it Pazuzu, and I'm yes. like, I cannot take that name seriously. No matter <laughs> what you say, even if you say in a demonic voice, I lose my shit every time. Pazuzu. Because, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seriously, and I'm like, your name is Pazuzu. I would not like. I'm out. I'm out. I, I, yeah, I'm, I can't honestly, take that whole movie seriously. And honestly, whenever I hear the name Pazuzu, the first thing that comes to mind is Professor Farnsworth from the episode of Futurama. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's, he's, got, he's got like that, that, that winged gargoyle pet of his that's named Pazuzu. Yes! It like leaves in the beginning of the episode and then shows up as like a deus ex machina at the end of the same day. Pazuzu! <laughs> so that's, that's all I hear. That's all I hear. But it, but it, is, actually, it is actually a real demon. It comes from a Mesopotamian Yes, oh, yes. That's Oh god! It's the, uh, the demon it, of the, Famine, I think. Um, demon it's, of yeah. wind or something. It's uh, it's mm-hmm. supposedly the Lord of the Winds, uh, represented by the southwest winds, and it's a uh, it's a, a demon of plague. Yes, so, I'm glad that was not explained in this movie. Yeah, no. the first one. I'm glad it was not explained. Yeah. It didn't mm-hmm. need to be. Yeah, the, the locust, the locust thing. I mean, is is involved in the original mythology, and that's heavily explored in the second one. Of uh, mm-hmm. course, with the. Yeah, but why would you want to see that? <laughs> <laughs> you can sit through, what was it, an hour and a half of BS for a locus scene? No. no. And poo Yeah. Well, that's no. probably why they didn't actually name the demon during this movie. Yeah. They they I'm didn't, they glad like they didn't. <laughs> the devil's fine. Yeah. That's and all then, you really need. That's all you needed. All but, you but, need. but of course, throughout the exorcism, you get you get hints of uh, the conversation with Father Matter, and you get hints that that the demon is claiming to be the devil and Satan, and but you can tell he's also lying. Mm-hmm. It's like there's a lot of hints of that, and of course, when we get the the statue reveal at the end, mm-hmm. it's like that's that's Pazuzu. That's yeah. what the, mm-hmm. that's what Pazuzu is portrayed as. That's what it looks like. <laughs> but then even there's a scene too where Linda Blair or Reagan, as they say in the movie, is the character she plays. She actually says in the bed. Oh, I'm the devil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. so, and that's all they say. Yes. There's no specific name, no nothing. So. Right. I, I think it's just one of those things in in writing, maybe that they just kind of overlooked and just raises questions more. Really, that could be. Yeah, but um, but uh, I love how I love how Pazuzu, even at least just the statue, it shows up a lot in in pop culture nowadays mm-hmm. since The Exorcist. Mm-hmm. It's like, because it's, uh, the same statue actually, actually shows up twice in Ridley Scott's movie Legend. Really? It's, uh, hmm. you, can, you can see a shot of it in the, uh, in the swamp before the giant evil tree when, uh, when Jack comes across Meg Mucklebones in the swamp and everything. There's a, the statue is there and then it shows up again in the chamber where, uh, where Tim Curry's character Darkness is holding the, uh, the unicorn to be killed later on. The statue oh, shows up there yeah. also. Okay. Oh, wow. Huh. I didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. And it shows up in an episode of The Venture Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this past season. The best it, reference. It shows up there. <laughs> That's the best reference, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> honestly, like, the movie probably has been parodied so many times and made so many other Exorcist movies because of it. Oh, of course. Like, oh, because yeah. of how For sure. popular oh, yeah. it is. Like, mm-hmm. That whole demon possession was the scariest thing at that time. Like people fainting, whatever, because you're not the, used the, to that. The mm-hmm. spider walk. That's... That actually was not inserted until the 2000 director's cut. That was not in the original um, original cut. Mm-hmm. I think, I don't know what it was, but it was a, it was a, I don't know if it was a studio choice or a director's choice, but they got rid of it for the theatrical version. I, I think because it took away. I think it was a director's choice because I okay. think I remember freaking talking about how it took away from the, the impact of um, Ellen Burstyn's character okay. just finding out her best friend died. Yeah. And I think that's why it, 
he said it wouldn't have had that much like of a shock and awe. It okay. was also a, I think it was also a technical decision too because the the act the actress who was doing it the, the, the contortionist stunt, yeah. the contortionist who was doing it um, they they had her on wires suspended above the above the steps so that she could do it safely, mm-hmm. but because of the wires that which they couldn't really edit out very well in, in back that, in the seventies, yes. um, they um, they also she her her touch on the steps wasn't wasn't heavy enough it didn't look heavy enough to be okay. realistic it, you know and what they did though even for that time was actually really impressive like th- did you know that when they did the the room reagan's room they literally froze that room with like oh, yeah. four or five yeah. heavy air conditioners yeah and so they had to make breath. sure it was like 40 below just to Ooh. see their breath mm-hmm. yeah Linda Blair said, to this day, she hates cold weather. It's cold weather because, because of that scene. I mean, Those that, scenes. I mean, that sounds worse than the ice bowl that the Packers and the Cowboys were in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was, what, negative 20, negative 15, negative 20, and Something they said, like oh, that. you've got to be negative 40 before you can even go in. Plus, with lights and people in the room and with the takes, it will get warm in there. Yeah. And then it will take the breath away. Yeah. And if they left them running i'm sure the audio would have picked up but mm-hmm. still it, clever effect i mm-hmm. mean and great of course and, and that's also another example of freaking like treating his actors like crap oh yeah <laughs> uh, yeah i mean oh the torture that they said um, they went through hell with yeah. this movie mm-hmm. i mean him, Alfred Hitchcock, they're notorious directors for really getting the realism out of their actors, mm-hmm. whether they like it or not. <laughs> well, it looks fantastic though. Like oh, when okay. they actually put him in the real area of what they're doing with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, it may suck on the actors, may put them through a lot, <laughs> but it, like after all it's said and done, it does look amazing when they do that. It's genuine on that authenticism. Note. I yeah. think there should be a certain extent though. Like, like you hear the stories about Linda Blair and Burstyn getting hurt. I really don't think anybody should get hurt on set. No, it's no, not, no, it's no, not no, worth no. it. I don't think anybody needs to get hurt on no. set. Yeah. That, no, yeah, I understand. But. They said that he also brought guns with blanks. Yeah, to the, um, to shoot for shock value. Jason Miller, like he shot the gun near Jason Miller's ear just to get an authentic mm-hmm. reaction off of him. He's mm-hmm. like, I didn't need that to, <laughs> to to look startled. Like I didn't need a gun going off near my face. Mm-hmm. And then uh, yeah. he, he slapped the priest like for the yes. for, for the end of the, the very scene, end the scene he, to try to get a reaction out mm-hmm, of him. He said mm-hmm. he gave he gave his last rites about fifteen times. It's oh, two gosh. in the morning. He said, "My best friend is dying. I like what more do you want me to do?" <laughs> and he said, "Do you trust me?" Well, yeah, I trust you. And he whacked him across the face. <laughs> oh my god! And I mean, that's why his hand's shaking. Yeah, at you, the you, end. yeah. You, you can absolutely see. Now, now on the other hand, would you rather have a, have a have a director who insists on going for realism in that way and getting as few shots as possible, or would you rather work with someone like Kubrick who insists that you do it 173 <laughs> times? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want it over and done with? Huh? Oh man. But Exorcist, I think, had a a budget of five million dollars, I believe. And it went over. Well, they went over shooting a lot. Too. Oh yeah, wasn't that supposed to be like a ninety-eight day shoot, and it went for like two twenty or something? A year, Ooh, I wow. think. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it was a, a long year. shoot for this movie. And yeah. Linda Blair was only twelve, and I want to say, you know, of course, except for Lord Damien, we weren't around at that time. Mm-hmm. But supposedly, when she read for the part. They had all the foul language there, too. And her mom yeah. was with, and her mom asked her how it went, and she said, I really can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I know, she because she was really hesitant, saying, I'm, I can't say these bad words. And the director's like, you can say them. It's fine. You know, it just... It's Reagan. It's, it's not Linda Blair who's saying it. Right, right. That okay. Was, okay. That was the okay key. Okay. But it was kind of cool. Her mom was actually in the movie, too. She was one of the nurses when they were doing the... Oh, really? I uh, think for the arteries. Really? Yeah. I she, didn't know that either. I just well, read that recently, and it caught me off guard, because I was like, you're really going to be in the one scene where your daughter's getting blood drawn? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, we, oh, William sweet. Peter Blatty had a cameo, I think, in he it, did. too. Mm-hmm. He did. But in the, on the movie set portion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the... Um, and it's it's funny it's funny we we've mentioned twice now the uh, the medical procedures that she she undergoes as far as testing, and and more people in the in the in the audiences like when they talk about like the the uh, the experience that the audience has had as far as people fainting or vomiting because of the uh, the the extreme. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the gore or the violence or whatever more Barf people bags in the movie theater <laughs> more yeah more, more people actually have problems with the medical procedures that she undergoes than the things oh, that do. she actually goes through 
uh, during the exorcism. Wow, that's that's my thing too. I every time I see the that needle, well, the needle is like this. And for anybody who can't see it, it's... Our <laughs> <laughs> audiences can't it's see a, how big the needle is. It's about six to eight inches. It's about a six to eight inch needle. And it goes in her neck. Her neck. And then you see it get pulled out and blood's just squirting. Mm. Ugh, yeah. Uh, Truthfully, yeah. I don't know if that's medically accurate, the squirting blood, because I feel like that's very unsanitary. <laughs> well, well, I mean, they, they could have been bad doctors. I, and, uh, I, I assure you that depending on where you stick somebody with anything pointy, a lot of blood is going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> I have to put newspapers down and try to have a meal. <laughs> Isn't it easier just with the plastic on the floor? It's easier to roll it up? <laughs> Go through a lot of tarps. Yeah. <laughs> Becomes Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be your ghoul's name is Dexter. Oh, sure. <laughs> lay, sure. <laughs> lay the plastic down for you. <laughs> no. But, um, but like, the, yeah, the, and the amount of the experiences that people were having as far as the filming goes, like, like the barfing and the vomiting and the fainting and everything that happens, um, the studio was actually sued because some guy got sick while trying to leave the movie theater, tripped and broke his jaw. Uh, oh! <laughs> they, oh. They, they, um, the, the company apparently settled, settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. That's how it usually is. And they probably yeah. just try to just, just shut them up and get rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> but it probably makes good publicity, even though, like... Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. I mean, just think. It, it's like any horror story by the campfire. Mm -hmm. Like, when we were younger, it was like, hey, can we hear the scary stories? No, you're too young. Well, well, why can't we hear them? You'll get scared. Well, what's so bad about them? Like, what's up with this Exorcist movie that everybody's getting sick and leaving the theater? You know, what's up? What is going on with yeah. that? Oh, in the 50s, they craved that kind of publicity. Oh, I mean, God. William <laughs> Castle, I mean, it was absolutely yeah. like handing out, handing out, like, life insurance, fake life insurance policies. <laughs> the father of the gimmick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, hang a skeleton from the ceiling of, of, the, movie, of Haunt, the movie theater. House of Haunted Hill. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And marketing at that time was so different than what it is today. I mean, word of mouth, which is technically still the greatest form of marketing, mm -hmm. that was what they really went by. Because you, I, I, I don't want to say TVs were in everybody's house, but they I yeah. think they were getting around. Mm -hmm. So you had maybe some commercials here and there, and then you yeah. had radio. That was still pretty If you big. had a TV, you had money. <laughs> um, newspapers. You know, which are going out of style now, too. I mean, now if it's not on the cell phone or we got things like uh, Rotten Tomatoes, IMDb, you know, Metacritic, even, even yeah. Twitter, you know. Twitter. So at that time, to hear people saying, oh, yeah, I mean, I remember Robert England, I think, was the one who said he saw The Exorcist in the theater and noticed somebody just drenched in sweat, just running out. And you could tell in a dark theater, just drenched in sweat and ran out of the theater. Yeah, You can't buy that kind of publicity. No. You can't. Yeah. I mean, you don't see that it, nowadays. It, you it, just it, don't. It, you know, like, when was the last time a horror movie had an impact like that? I, I want to say Blair Witch. Maybe? I would say Blair Witch because it convinced the entire world that it was real when it was yeah. fake. Mm -hmm. And that was all based on the marketing. The internet marketing campaign. You know, yeah. it was this, like, is it a real movie? A like, website. Like, <laughs> and then you had people saying, oh, I left the theater feeling weird and nauseous. And it's like, yeah, well, no, it does because the camera's going like this. <laughs> Shaky cam. Oh, uh, yeah. And then, and then it instantly became cliche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people realize, oh, they can't actually show people dying on camera and show it to the public like there's no way they'd get away with something like that then it becomes cannibal holocaust where the directors got arrested 10 days after the film was made <laughs> but also just think at that time nobody really saw makeup like that on linda blair either and it's this slow progression like yeah. you know like they say she's got these apple cheeks a button nose and mm -hmm. there's this innocent happy-go-lucky girl and then all of a sudden it, it is kind of like a why her and I think that's yeah. even, like, what they say in the movie is, like, why her? Right. And I think it was, uh, what was Von Sydow? Was it Father Marin. Father Marin. And he's talking to, what was Jason Miller's name? Father, Father Karras. Karras. And Father Karras was the one who said, why her? And Father Marin said, it's because the devil wants to make you think God doesn't love you and that 
he's going to inhabit this girl to trick you. And it's like, wow. Very psychological. Oh, very. Very. And it, it really makes you think. And, you know, you know, I'm not a father, mm-hmm. but I would think, like, if that's my kid, I, I, I'd be fuming because it's like, I don't know what to do. That's kind of what was really interesting about uh, Ellen Burns' character is that she's this Hollywood actress. Mm-hmm. She's making money. She's making a career of making movies, and she has all these, all this money and all this publicity, and all this great life. credit. And no matter how much money you throw at this problem, it's not getting any better. No, and that's what makes it it's more getting like, worse. She's having these conversations with like these eighty doctors, and they have no idea what's going on with her daughter. And no matter how much money she throws at the table, it's not working. It's not helping. Mm-hmm. It it gives you that uh, fear of paranoia, and no matter where your status is in life, there are some things you just can't help. There are just some things you can't fix to solve your problems. And, and actually, and part, part of her costuming also that, that she actually added with, was to show that despite everything that she has at her disposal, she's ill-equipped to, to fight a, a war based on faith. Mm-hmm. And um, in order to try to do that, they they focus and I, uh, a little bit. And uh, I know what she did. She she actually bought a uh, a charm bracelet with a a horseshoe on it. Mm-hmm. And that was that was like her adding a little something to the characters. Like this is it. It's just like this tiny little bit of superstitious Sometimes it's nonsense that she holds on, and mm-hmm. and that's what she has, and that's all she's equipped with because she's not she she's not a person a person of faith, and she doesn't know how to go about doing this. Right. But that, that's it's it's a little it, I I love little things like that like the little details oh, me too. Like, yeah. that, that even actors bring on to on onto set and costumes and acting oh, yeah. things to, to bring up their character. The little details go a long way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, like I said, just even if Linda Blair didn't have the contacts in, mm-hmm. the, it, I don't think it would have worked as well. Mm-hmm. You know, no, no, and no. the teeth, you know, you got to have the teeth and the cuts and the contacts. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, it just doesn't work. I mean, and if people were afraid of Kiss and Alice Cooper at that time, <laughs> I can only imagine why they were the way they were in the theater. <laughs> well, the, I think Linda Blair's makeup was a lot more graphic than what Kiss or Alice Cooper could put on. Well, but what I'm saying, Cooper, I'm sorry. but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but I understand. It's like that whole setup, the whole like her eyes being sunken in, her the everything coming out, the oozing. Yeah, like, dude, that, that's gonna fuck you up when you're looking at it. Like, mm-hmm. what the fuck is she actually physically going through? Because like everything is coming out of her face and literally out of her stomach. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Her stomach. Oh yeah, that's hot and, pea ooh. soup. <laughs> and it's and it's a it's a good thing that they they actually went with hot makeup too because the original makeup design that uh, that failed uh, like testing was the, what we see later on is the white face of the demon that shows up in the darkness mm-hmm. oh, that, yeah. that was actually the, the failed makeup test <laughs> oh okay. uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the stunt actress so they oh, wow. they, they, they brought, brought it in some way but they decided to go a different direction so wait, wait. actually on rig <laughs> the, the failed makeup they're like you know we still already have this concept we're just gonna throw it in like a quick like here you go Sure, yeah, why yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've done it, we've spent the money on it, we've taken a shot of it. Let's use it somewhere. It looks good. <laughs> on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like, even, even Linda Blair was apparently freaked out by the makeup because uh, they had to put the exact same makeup on the, uh, on the stunt dummy of her. And they had to sit her next to the stunt dummy oh, when she would oh. go through makeup in the morning so that they could get it exactly right. And she hated sitting next to that thing. She was terrified. I can only imagine. She was terrified of her own stunt dummy. I mean, speaking of the stunt dummy, I've seen the sit up, you know, for the first initial head spin. Mm-hmm. Not the second one, not the one where it went all the way around, but the mm. first one where it just sat up. Yeah. And it honestly reminded me of the Annabelle doll. I wonder if that actually had some sort of influence as to what the Annabelle doll looked like. I can see that. I can see that. For the Conjuring movie. Because, you know, the real Annabelle doll looks nothing like it. Yeah, it's just a No, yeah. 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 So, it it just like with the dress and the way the face and the hair was, I was like, huh, it kind of struck me. It's totally possible. I mean, as influential as this movie has been over Mm -hmm. over the years, all the the parodies and all the homages to everything. Same production company, Warner Brothers, you know, they produce the Conjuring films and the Annabelle films, so it makes sense. I can see that. And going back to what you said about Linda Blair's stunt actress, she actually played a big part in it and doesn't really get too much credit for her part in the movie. Neither the stunt actress nor the uh, the voice actress who actually does the demon's voice during during the movie. She actually had to sue... So that she could be credited for it. Yep. After the movie first came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the whole thing behind it, though, she originally didn't want the credit. She wanted it all to be 
on Reagan Linda Blair. But then yes. when she saw how popular it got, she's like, well, I did all this work. I should now get a little bit of credit for it. Did she say that or was that a studio thing? It was her originally. Okay. And the yeah. studio backed it up. And then, but she felt that she wanted the credit because the amount of crap that she did to her voice. To oh get my that God. Swallowing raw eggs. Raw or eggs. Smoking, smoking, chain smoking, smoking drinking they, they to alter her voice. That, uh, the, she strapped herself down to the chair and actually put it on her throat so she could get that really deep and I think like be, she they, was a recovering alcoholic, but she needed somebody there so she could get the whiskey voice. Yeah. Didn't they also kind of tie her up, similar yeah. to Linda Blair too, yeah, like make her hands, feel like the throat mm-hmm. and everything? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I can see why she wanted to give Reagan Linda Blair the credit, but still like she put her body through hell to get yeah. that. Yeah. So like either way, they should have just thrown it in there no matter what. Oh yeah. And and that's not, of course, to to not take away any of the credit from Linda Blair's actual performance. I oh mean, no, it was still a great performance. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. that girl gets the hell beat out of her. Literally. She does, literally. Yeah, yeah. literally. I, I I almost kind of wondered uh, exactly what her voice did actually sound like while filming the uh, the actual scenes, though. Con- considering yeah. that, considering yeah. when she first delivers her lines, she actually stunned Max von Sydow into silence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 He was yeah. So offended. He, he completely yeah. forgot his lines yes. while filming because he was <laughs> completely taken aback by this foul mouth. 12 year old. Oh, <laughs> this little girl, cute as she is, swearing at you, what is your first reaction is not going to be like, well, I'm going to get this line. No, it's going to be like, what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> like, here's the Christmas list, and your name is off. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the stunt woman, too, she played a huge part, and she was actually brought on for uh, the masturbation scene with the cross originally. <laughs> oh. Just hearing that. Yeah, I know. It, 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 but it, effective, though, huh? Yeah. After all these years, it, something that makes you go, wait, what'd you say? It's like, yeah. That, that happened. <laughs> That's in the movie. <laughs> Honestly, like, um, when they were, were talking about it, like, not really talking about it, when they showed it in the movie, like, obviously they're going to cut out a lot of the extra graphic stuff they had in the book. And I'm kind of glad because it's really bad. Like, mm. come on, she actually ends up breaking her nose because of how hard she's going with it. And there, I'm like, I'm good with whatever we got to see. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. We don't need any yes. more than that. We don't need yeah. more than that. The, the book, it's, it's far more bloody. There's far more involved. She actually climaxes. We don't need to see all that from the no. top of your no. world on, on screen. Right. That, that's where a difference between a book and a movie, mm-hmm. like yes. having limitations from a movie, are good. Mm-hmm. Right. Look you at know. Stephen King's It that came out two years ago. I'm glad there are certain things that were not put in that film that were in the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. That with, one with, scene. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beverly Marsh. <laughs> well, the, the, the stunt actress who, who they used for that, I, I, I had read that Linda Blair was actually there for most of the actual like cru- uh, crucifix masturbation scene. She did a lot of that herself. But mm-hmm. the, uh, the other actress was brought on so that... Um, because they wanted somebody with more heft to smack yes. uh, the, the mother away, and that's that's the scene where she hurts she, back, she gets yeah. she gets she hurts her back, isn't it? But they they had to have a stunt actress because she, Linda Blair wasn't big enough to to, <laughs> to pull it off. Well, I think I, they also said like the way she did backhand, it just mm-hmm. looked like something a child would do, and it just looked like she didn't have the strength or the muscles to really give that. Like power, right? Right. Know. She, yeah. But if you think about it, a child possessed wouldn't matter how big you really are. Like even the daintiest person mm-hmm. demon possessed is going to. Oh, have I agree. Um, yeah, I but agree. I, but I, I think from a from a cinematic point of view, as far as like bringing some from depth of reality to it, or I think it's that difference between illusion versus delusion. Yeah. Like if you see it, and even though you go, okay, yeah, I I I understand that that can happen, but. It's one of those things where it just kind of takes you out if it doesn't look it. I mean, especially because freaking was always, you know, hurt you, hurt you, do whatever I can to get what I want to make it look real. So, I mean, if he's looking for realism, that's probably why he went for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it makes sense. Like, you want to see that bear build And he, he was that kind of director because he did the French Connection. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, like, he was that kind that. of director. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we we keep we keep mentioning the the stunt actress. Her name is Eileen Dietz. Eileen Dietz. Eileen Dietz. Dietz. She okay. doubled. She doubled for the vomiting scene. She doubled for the uh, for for that for the scene we were just talking about. She's she's the one that actually did the spider walk. Mm-hmm. So okay. she she's like there's basically three different people have to have to come together to make possessed Regan. <laughs> it's mostly Linda Blair, but a lot of the like the major stuff that people remember are are wow. the are the combination of the stunt actress and the voice actress. Sometimes it, it takes more than one person to 
create a character. Oh, yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, Darth Vader wouldn't be Darth Vader without James Earl Jones. True. Mm-hmm. And, um... Oh, who's it, who's actually in the bloody suit? What's his name? David Prowse. David Prowse. That's thank right, you, yeah. Thank you. I couldn't, couldn't remember his name for the moment. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I love, I love that the only other movie I've ever seen David Prowse in is Clockwork Orange. Yeah. <laughs> is he Clockwork Orange? He's, he's the nurse who... He, he's the for real? He's yeah. the oh, shit. The he's the nurse. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the long hair? The black hair? I... He, he, look, he looks he's like... A, he he looks like Clark Kent in Speedos. Yes. <laughs> oh, my okay. God. <laughs> I gotta watch that movie again still. And 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 that comes down to to the brilliance of of casting again. I mean, this movie is is cast so extremely well, and mm-hmm. uh, and Linda Blair like she beat out what was it like a hundred and forty four other people who were up for this role. Of, Something uh, like that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, and and like the the names that were were attached to this for. Yeah, oh, we're, look, we're looking at pictures of, of, uh, of David Prowse. He kind of looks like a fucked up Brad from Rocky Horror. <laughs> <laughs> but but like but the, the casting for this film, I mean, uh, Linda Blair beat out how many other people? Like we, we said, one hundred forty something. Yeah, one hundred forty something. A full a full gross of of other people. <laughs> um, she she beat out for this. Uh, people who were up for the role were also. Uh, uh, the girl who played Violet Beauregard in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. She oh, was actually wow. up for that. Oh, okay. Um, really? There's like a whole other people. Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis. and uh, Really? Was, was actually yeah. up for it, um, but her mother, ex <laughs> Isn't that funny? Uh, <laughs> old Janet Lee, Scream Queen. Yeah. Uh, suppose, suppose, and, and, and then look what happened to Jamie Lee later. I know. Yeah, really. <laughs> I got my own horror franchise. <laughs> right, right. Um, supposedly, Carrie Fisher and her mom, Debbie Reynolds, were actually up for the mother daughter combo of this film, also. There's a lot oh, of that. That'd be things. interesting. That would've, yeah, that would have been. That would have been interesting. Yeah. It might look good on paper. I think it could work, but Carrie Fisher was a lot older though than what Linda Blair was at the time. Yes, yeah, she at the time I I, I maybe Star Wars uh, came out in seventy seven. She was like sixteen. Okay. Well, Carrie, think... when Carrie passed away, wasn't she sixty? I don't remember. I don't remember either. I, but I think she was she was only like sixteen or seventeen when she did. The first Star Wars movie. That young, okay. I thought she was a little bit older. Yeah, okay. she was in like 18 to 20. Yeah, so she was yeah. probably like 12 or 13 when The Exorcist mm-hmm. Okay, then that, I can, and, see, and, that. I can and, see that then. Okay. And, they, and they were actually they were actually letting people who were a little bit older uh, go out for the part of Reagan as long as they could look that young. Ah, okay. As like, uh, mm-hmm. Supposedly, uh, the director was so frustrated by their, their lack of options, despite the 144 people showing up, <laughs> that um, he actually was considering uh, just hiring... Little people actors. <laughs> oh god! Oh, that may not have been taken seriously. That, I, yeah, that's that's probably a very would have been a bad decision. No. Carrie Fisher was born in 1956, and Linda Blair was born in 1959. So Linda Blair would have been a little younger. Yes. Three years younger. Three years yeah. younger. Okay. Yeah. Not that not that that much of a difference. No. no. It, it could have could have happened. But it's like, like we said, uh, we said earlier, Jack Nicholson was up for, yeah. the, up for the role of Father Carries. It's like nobody's going to see that, and, yeah. and apparently, yeah. um, the Freed can cast um, Jason Miller as Carries after seeing him on Broadway. Okay. Said, oh, wow. said the performance that he saw on Broadway reeked of uh, failed Catholicism, <laughs> and that's actually why he cast him. This is actually this is reeked Jason, of J- failed. Catholicism. Reeked of failed Catholicism, and that, and that earned him Jason. Jason Miller earned his very. This is his first. Movie role. First movie role, okay. And wasn't um, Father Karras's best friend, the other priest, he's actually a real priest who knew Friedkin, right? He is actually a real priest. He was a Jesuit priest. I think he retired um, a year or two ago. He was actually involved in the, in some controversy a few years ago because he actually teaches at, a, at a, I think, a Catholic college or something. But he's... He's far more liberal than what most people think of when oh. they think of a, of, a, of a Catholic priest, and that earned him. He's he's he has got he's got no problem with foul language in the classroom, <laughs> and he, he'll yeah. curse quite often, and he has a lot of liberal thinking. And that I think they were looking at firing him, and there was like a whole rally behind him to keep him <laughs> in state and in his job. But yeah, he's so he he was a real Catholic priest. Um, 
the, uh, Freed can actually ask him to perform an exorcism. I do remember um, hearing that. Okay. On the set, because people were, people were worried about uh, all the things that were going on. And he said, I, I don't think that's a good idea, because I think that'll actually make people more anxious. Okay. So he didn't perform an exorcism. There was no exorcism <laughs> on set. But, but they did have another priest come in and just give a blessing and talk mm. to people okay. who, who might yeah. have been anxious. Yes. Well, I believe it was Jason Miller, too, who he had explained his two cents. I forget if it was to a priest or just somebody religious. He said that he was doing this movie called The Exorcist and went on to explain it. And he, um, he actually received... A, like some sort of holy trinket, I believe. And they, he said, what's this for? And it was because they're exposing the devil and the devil doesn't like that and he'll take it out on others is what they say. So mm -hmm. they said, here's a holy you know, trinket to protect yourself. Hmm. That was a story I'd heard. Uh, I, wonder what they, I wonder what they gave him. I actually, um, I actually usually wear a, a ring with the, uh, the Medal of St. Benedict on it. It's, oh. it's actually used in, in exorcisms. That's why I, why I hold oh, on to okay. it myself. Well, you've done how many of them? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, three, 300 years at this. You know, yeah. it's, 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 you're, you're bound to come across. Got some experience. <laughs> right. And I think you need to build that resume a little more. Right. It's, it's right. 2019 now. <laughs> Gonna update that thing a bit. Um, <laughs> I, I know that there was a lot of other casting choices going through here, and I can't I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. Um, uh, there's there really is so much to talk about this movie. There's a lot. Um, I think we covered the main gist of it. I don't think there's really too much else that was secretive or that nobody really knew. I know. I think we need to talk about the ending of the movie because that is definitely a big point. I noticed some people who. Who have seen it, they do kind of they, they they kind of tend to think the ending's a bit of a downer. Like there's not there, there's not like a like a triumphant win or so, you know. It, it kind of is, but it's like a big sigh of relief. Yeah. When it ends. Because this movie from the beginning doesn't let you out with that claustrophobia and with that dread. And then finally when Father Karras plunges through the window and he dies and Reagan is finally weeping and crying. It's like, oh my God, it's finally over. Like, maybe she's back to normal again. I, I think <laughs> another thing, though, is the two priests, spoiler alert, they <laughs> die. Wait, if you, like we said, if you haven't seen this movie, there's still something, there's something yeah. wrong with you. If you haven't I'm seen not this denying movie. that. I'm not denying this movie's 40 years old and you haven't seen it by now. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. But... You know, you go in and you see Father Marin is dead. Father Karras goes in and sees he's dead. Mm -hmm. And then he sees that Marin, uh, not Marin, Reagan is unhooked. So Father Karras then attacks Reagan, the devil, and he keeps saying, take me, take me. And finally, the devil goes in the Karras. And you can tell he's trying to fight it, and he sees Reagan crying, and then he just screams, no, and he jumps out the window. And that's actually, like, a really horrific scene, especially for that time. Like, oh, how the stunt double pulled that off. Plunge through the window, then go down that flight of stairs. And yeah. it rolled down heavy. Dude, mm -hmm. the, the gap between the window and the fence, and where the stairs are at, it's a quite a And, and a isn't distance. that fence, doesn't it have, like, the steel spikes yeah, the metal, at it? It does. So, like, oh, damn. He had to launch himself far enough to miss that uh -huh. and then the stairs. Cool. So, it, it's kind of like, like you guys said, it's like there's a build-up for it, but then after that, like, when he does do this and everything ends and Reagan's, like, now getting better, it's like, yeah, it's a sigh of relief, but it really is, like, here you go, this is it. This is what's going to happen. And, like, even at the end, when they everything is done and the priest and the cop are talking, like, they figured out that this is done, so what are they talking about? What, Wuthering Heights? Going to the movie? Yeah. <laughs> that that, 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 that becomes a conversation throughout. It's, 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 a, it's a running gag throughout it is, the entire it movie. Is, it trying is. to get someone to go to the movies with them. And, and it continues on into the sequel, too, I think, until they <laughs> Does it really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. He dies. Oh, my God. That, I, think, I think in the sequel, they finally movie. go see, oh, It's a Wonderful Life. That I fucking think. movie. <laughs> <laughs> Another reason to not see it. <laughs> I, I'm, I like I like that the uh, the ending of the film though. If after all of that, I it's kind of ambiguous too. Yeah. Like you're mm -hmm. never quite sure if if Father Karen has uh, Karis has uh, has actually Karen. Yeah, I, I put the, I put the put two them, together. You put them together. together. You combine the Father Father Karis, you, you don't know if he's if he's beaten it because he's found his faith, 
which he's been struggling with through like the entire film. And oh, that's, because and that's, of his yeah. really why he's yeah, here. Yeah, we didn't talk about his Yeah, we, yes. we, we, we don't know if he's, if he's finally found a way to beat it because he's found his faith again and he's strong in his faith, or if it's simply because he's... He's found something else to care about, and he's willing to sacrifice himself to help somebody else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of yeah. leaves it open whether or not he's winning because of one thing or the other, or if it's some mm-hmm. combination of the two. Right. There's a moment, I know, like, right before he goes into the bedroom to, to see Father Marin and Reagan, he's, like, hunched over, sitting on the steps, like, beaten. Like, this exorcism is not going well. It's failing. Mm-hmm. Well, they and do, then, not to take you away, but they do say that real exorcisms are like very exhausting they are oh yeah so it's exhausting it's not working nothing's going their way and then um ellen bernstein goes up and says is my daughter going to die mm-hmm. and then he just kind of stops looks at her and says no it's she's not going to die i think that's like a little spark of the moment where like i'm getting my faith back like i'm not gonna let this little girl die i'm gonna go back in there and mm-hmm. make this right it's like you see a little spark of him trying to reignite his faith at that moment. That was a really powerful moment. It's such a tiny Very. little scene. Tiny little scene, but mm-hmm. he's Again, beaten. the little things. Yeah. Yeah. He's beaten. He's tired. It's not working. And then just that question that she asks him, is my daughter going to die? No, she's not. And, and, at that, and up to that point, it's, it's almost not something that's actually questioned throughout the movie. It's like as much as, as Regan is going through during the exorcism and through the possession in general, mm-hmm. you, you never really get a sense of question of whether or not this is going to end with, in, in her death. Mm-hmm. It's, like you, it's just a question of whether or not this is going to continue on and if she's, is she going to be stuck this way. I, there's, I, there's, never, there's never anything that gives you any kind of indication as far as is her life in danger or just her immortal soul? Yeah. And maybe at that point when, when, the, when the mother asks, that's, that's when it finally dawns on him, like, this could be... She's actually in mortal peril as well as immortal peril. Yeah. I think it's also more of a how are they going to overcome this? Mm-hmm. Because at that time, it, like, how do you fight the devil? How do you fight possession? You know, faith. Faith, yeah. Faith. I mean... It, <laughs> Get a holy hand grenade. <laughs> <laughs> Count for five I, seconds. I, I think we also forgot... Three, three seconds. Three seconds. Three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should mention, too, that not only was um, William Peter Blatty, uh, he wrote a book about it, but this was also based on a true story. It was. Except the child wasn't a girl, it was a boy. No, it was a boy. And he did do his research, and he asked uh, Catholic priests about... The behind the scenes to the real exorcism and they mm-hmm. said they cannot expose any of this they, they could i think they told him but they said you can't have what we tell you directly in your story yeah what, what we see in the movie is not a full official exorcism it's it's kind of interpretation of of the actual exorcism practices it's yeah. it's it's long and complicated it can last it can last days even months. weeks or months at, at times yeah mm-hmm. Depending on who's doing it and what's what's happening, of course. <laughs> All right. But uh, I was going to mention something else, and I it to- totally slipped my mind. <laughs> Should we go around and talk about the scenes, like our favorite scenes at all? Uh, yeah. Uh, Newports. Newports. No, 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 go ahead. So, I'll leave it up to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you go You're to film next. school? Yeah, you did go to film no, school. I saw this movie like ten years ago, one time, and. Uh, well, at least you saw it. Yeah, at least yeah, I saw it. You did see it. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're not spoiling anything for you. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> oh, By the way, God. the priest dies. Both of them. So, <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry to wreck the end of the priest. Is too I know, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, what's the body count of this movie? It's only four, isn't it? It's yeah. the, two, the two priests. Um, the director. The, the director. director of the film. The, yeah. uh, right. Um, I mean, I mean the the body count in the movie, not not like all the bad crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four in the movie, nine outside yeah. of the movie. <laughs> well, well, the um the, the the first person that falls out the window and Burke, and, the and, director of Ellen Bernstein's movie, right. yeah. uh, and when they fall out the window, their head gets twisted around. Yes. When when Linda Blair's uh, when when Reagan actually twists her head around during the possession. It's supposed to mimic what happened to the director when they fell out. This ah, thing. It's a, it's, that makes sense. Okay, that's yeah. that's when when she's when the line is. Do you know what she did? Yeah, it's it's referring to to the death of the director whose head was twisted around. And uh, William Blatty actually said that the uh, when Friedkin like planned for this shot, he actually misinterpreted what the book says. It's like in the in the movie 
her head like spins around like a full three sixty, but uh, in the book it's it's only it's only like a one eighty. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Not to take away anything from you. <laughs> but yeah, like. For me, this movie is top five horror movies of all time. I mean, this movie was nominated for Best Picture for a reason. A lot of people still think that this is a film that glorifies Satan. It's not. It's a movie about faith and redemption. It's, And for me, it gives an awareness of how important horror movies are to a lot of people and how it's an underappreciated genre. It really is. Because this is really the only true horror movie that was actually nominated for Best Picture. You can make a mm-hmm. claim for The mm-hmm. Sixth Sense, and you can make a claim for Silence of the Lambs. They were more psychological thrillers. They were mystery suspense movies. They weren't true horror movies, not like The Exorcist. No. And that's what makes it stand to this day. It stands mm-hmm. the test of time. I mean, we've talked about a lot of scenes here that are just amazing. There's just, for me, it's the conversations. The conversations that take place that are just so interesting between not just um, Father Karras and the detective. Uh, did we mention his name before? I don't know if we did or the not. The detective? Uh, who, who, I'm not... No, we didn't really mention him. We didn't mention him a lot, but like his investigation going on with Bert's death and how his head was turned completely around, whether or not that happened before he left the window or that was on the impact of the staircase. I mean, this director, he made a staircase terrifying. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> Just both in the house and, and outside, outside the house, he made a staircase terrifying. And this movie, it doesn't utilize the jump scare tactic that has no. plagued horror movies to this day. The jump scare. There are no jump scares in this movie. It's done with great sound design, with great music. There's not a whole lot of musical score, but the, the theme, sound, the, the theme, theme is still song, it, very iconic. That's one thing I love about this movie is that you don't feel like a, a cat jumps in front of you and you get this little burst of sound effect. Like, that doesn't happen. This movie, like I said from the beginning, it doesn't let you out until Father Karras goes through the window and then mm-hmm. basically Reagan is back to normal. Like, even from, like, the time when uh, Father Marin is, you know, in the Middle East... The clock stops in his office, and then you just feel like this uneasiness. They're just little little things, little things like the dogs out in the yard, like tearing over like a piece of meat, and then the statue in the distance. Like there's just these little imagery that just stays with you until the very end of the movie. Very. It doesn't let you out, and you know I'm glad you know the contortionist scene was added because I saw the 2000 version. I didn't see the original cut of what it was back in '73, but that contortionist scene going down the staircase and her mouth is just drooling blood I'm like Ugh. that was what really that almost sent me to the hills <laughs> that scene right there did you say that's your favorite scene i would probably well that scene and then the conversations i guess between father Karras and then the devil they were actually quite interesting when she's speaking the different languages and then when they're just having this talk about oh when is an excellent day for an exorcism like you want that you want exorcism I think the reason that. for that is because that was supposed to be Pazuzu mm-hmm. <laughs> getting Marin back. But yeah. Because when he first enters the house, it, it's, you know, it's you even hear it go, yeah. Marin! That's true, that's true. But yeah, it just becomes this big psychological Sorry, battle between. <laughs> He's losing it. I can't handle that fucking name. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 My name is Look at you guys are. Aren't you glad it wasn't said in the original? <laughs> I know. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it ruined the experience for you. <laughs> Dude, ever just, since just I've seen a little bit. knocking it out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But yeah, the final thing I'm going to say is just the psychological war between the devil and and catholicism between father Karras and marin just she's strapped to the bed and you that voice that voice still terrifies me it terrifies oh. one freaking to this day just don't i mean say I don't know, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound <laughs> human it doesn't and like you don't really see kind of good authentic voiceover actors like that can do that much punishing damaging quality to their voice. I mean, you know, there are some, there are some still really great voiceover actors, Mark Hamill and Brad Dorff, mm-hmm. you know, that are, you know, still amazing, but this is just, it's iconic. It doesn't sound human. It sounds like an entity. And that's what really was effective. This movie is, I just love it so much. I just, I just love that it, horror movies need to get more attention mm-hmm. for 
not not just not going beyond the Oscars here and there, but they just need more recognition in general. And then they just start making because it wasn't until what two thousand seven where basically horror movies were in a funk, and then indie horror kind of saved it for a bit. And indie horror is still going strong to this day, but this was. This is mainstream horror. You don't really see a whole lot of oh, great no. mainstream horror that still lingers to fans. And the fact that this is one of those movies that shook the world. People wanted to have exorcisms after this movie came out. People wanted to go to church to have demons exorcised from them. Well, because be this fun. is a movie that... Sh- yeah, it might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone has a demon. Everyone, everyone, demon. Everyone, in the everyone thinks they have a demon inside them. On a Sunday morning looks like they're having a fantastic time. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Just like the Blair Witch Project. This is a movie that shook the world. I mm-hmm. mean... And it's still being felt to this day. And I... Do you have a least favorite scene? I have a least favorite scene. <sighs> if not, it's a... You know, I don't think I do have a least favorite scene for this movie. Ooh. You know, actually, there, there's one little bit I want to uh, mention about the very end when um, uh, Reagan sees the crucifix on the priest when, when, you know, she doesn't remember any of it. I'm glad she actually doesn't remember anything about what happened with the exorcism. That's kind of interesting in that first movie because the second movie goes into more about that. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. But she sees this, the crucifix on, um, I forget the priest's name, but she runs after him. You're like, oh my God, what's she going to do to this guy? And then she just gives him a hug, hug and a kiss. I'm like, oh... <laughs> Don't do that, but do that, but don't do what I thought you were going to do was, was attack him. But, and then that final shot of just like them two walking away and then the score plays and then that, that one last shot with the staircase going down. Mm-hmm. So good. So good. Jeff? How the fuck am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, I'm like, well, you've hit like everything. I'm like, well, there's more that you can talk about. I know, but like, still like, you went in like great detail and I'm like, well, Fucking gonna sound stupid. <laughs> hey, I, but I, Pazuzu. Pazuzu. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Pazuzu. But truthfully, like I feel like this movie does hold up in the test of time. No matter what we think that it doesn't, no matter what what it is, it literally does hold up. Like. Just was it? We watched it last week or so. Mm-hmm. Honestly, like I still enjoy watching it. There's nothing I could complain about it. But I would say just watch if you watch both sets of movies, like the three actual to the directors, you're gonna enjoy both of them because like what they expand into the director's cut makes it more enjoyable. And like truthfully, like the one scene that I really think is kind of fucked up is when the mom comes down to the basement. She's playing with the Ouija board, already having set the tone for the movie with that too. She's not really, like, hesitant about, like, why she's playing with the Ouija board. Everyone knows that there's something wrong with it. And the fact that it does move by itself. Mm. And she thinks it's her daughter. But, like, right there, that sets your tone for, like, yeah, there's more shit to come. And, like, I feel like that is a good starting point for showing that Reagan is eventually going to get possessed. And then when, during the whole dinner party, when she starts relieving herself onto the floor, I was like, there really wasn't as much of a shock to everyone in the room because like it made it seem like they all knew this was coming when truthfully like I feel like there would have been a lot more shock to it that was probably like a low point in that movie because like yeah I know you're all actors I know that this is all what's happening but yet yeah, this girl we're saying what 12 I think it was yeah mm-hmm. she's literally pissing all over the floor and just blank face the whole time the only person that really reacts well is her mom because like well my daughter's sick now uh, and she kind of even like nonchalantly because she was embarrassed that her daughter was pissing all over the floor. That, I felt, was like, yeah, it was really good acting, but I feel like everybody outside of those two really should have acted a little bit better with that. Okay. Because I feel like the reaction wasn't always there. Mm-hmm. But it's saying that, like, literally, what, a five-minute scene out of a almost two-hour-long movie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There really isn't nothing else. Like, I'm damn near nitpicking at this point. It's just <laughs> the same <sense of>, like, <laughs> <laughs> But, like, even towards the end, like, he's saying, like, when they're doing the exorcism and... The, you can see that the younger priest is starting to feel everything. Like, he's starting to feel run down, but then you see, like, he is starting to um, question his faith. And, like, he, he's like, am I really up to the challenge of taking out this demon? And then he, that's why he eventually leaves the room, and then the elder priest goes in and obviously has a heart attack. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, but he, as he said, the mom asking if the child's going to die. Like, yeah, it's going to reignite everything. So, but it's like... With all the key elements there, it's like, yeah, there, there's a lot going on. There's really no real low point. Like I said, I had a nitpick for a while. <laughs> 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 but, 
Lord Damien, what is your favorite, least favorite, and uh, what do you take away from it? Well, see, I have the same problem Jeff does. I mean, John talked about it so much and in such great detail, you know, to close off. It's like, it's, it's hard to come up with anything different. Um, but it, but yeah, again, we, we keep saying it because it's true. This movie is, is absolutely iconic. I mean, coming from my standpoint, I, I feel a little bit like Beetlejuice sometimes at the time, though, because, you know, I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times. <laughs> and um, it keeps getting fire. Um, uh, like, I, I, I don't honestly think it keeps getting funnier. But I, I think I appreciate it more and more as the years go on, especially considering the, uh, the state that horror has, has drifted into, apart from some of the independent stuff these days. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, this movie is all about, um, the, I think the word you used was claustrophobic. Yeah. Yes. And, and, it yes. Fe- and it really does feel like that. As the tension rises, things become more and more constricted. And this movie is like just dripping with, with atmosphere. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of like, of atmosphere, especially in horror movies. It's a um, huge part of horror it movies. Is. It, it, it is. Um, I, and mm-hmm. and it's, it's probably cliche, but I think, my, honestly, my favorite part, my favorite scene in the movie is probably that when Father Marin first pulls up in the cab and we get that, that iconic shot yeah. of the, of the mm-hmm. light from the, the room poster. coming down, yeah. mm-hmm. that, um, which, uh, which Friedkin uh, was inspired to do after seeing some... Bosch, a, a, a Bosch series, paintings? Um, not, not Bosch, but it was, there was actually a series of oil paintings um, okay. Okay. Um, that, that, he was, that he was inspired by. And it's like just that shot alone. It's like you see that and you almost everybody can instantly identify what movie this mm-hmm. is if they, oh, if they sure. were to see that. Um, but yeah, like the, uh, the, the atmosphere, the, the, this, this is that perfect combination of absolutely everything co- coming together to create something which becomes more and more tense and terrifying as it goes on. It's like, there's no jump scares. There's everything. Everything just builds and builds and tightens and tightens. It's like, it's, it's like you're being suffocated by a, by a boa constrictor towards the end of the film. Yeah. And it's like, and it, there's, and that's what John was saying is like, suddenly there's a release. And but it's, but it's still, it still kind of leaves it open-ended and, mm-hmm. and ev- every, every, shot uh every like every shot is fantastic the the acting the voice acting the stunt work in this is is phenomenal and the amount of sacrifices that people put themselves through in order to put this is something that's that i i i appreciate the hell out of um i'm, I'm not sure how, how much more i can build on that <laughs> yeah, um, I, I i don't know if i have a i don't really know if i have a, a least favorite scene not, uh, okay. in, in in the film um um but again, I mean, it's also partially one of the reasons I also love the film is also because it's 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 been so influential because it is such a part of of history, and mm-hmm. there is so much so much history and lore and detail into the film. It's like that's that's what I love. I love atmosphere and and the little details that people put into mm-hmm. things, like mm-hmm. like the symbolism behind every tiny little thing that goes into stuff, yeah. um, and uh, and we get a piece of history here that people can see that people might not be able to see anymore um uh, even if it is just the uh the archaeological dig site at the beginning of the movie mm-hmm. um because it's uh it's the ancient city of hatra in iraq which was almost okay. completely wiped out by isis over the last five years oh okay. wow. Wow. so so we we get to see like at least glimpses and pieces of stuff that, that people might not be able to ever experience in mm-hmm. real life How about and that? Um, but, but again, yeah, it's, it's iconic. It's, it's almost virtually perfect. And there's, there's absolutely a reason this movie has stood the test of time and will continue to do so. I don't know what else I can say. About. <laughs> that was perfect. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I really don't have much to add to it other than basically what you guys said. And it's funny you mentioned the poster because I have to say that's probably my favorite scene too. It's just something about when he arrives and you know, you talk about sets and that lighting and the atmosphere and just seeing the car drive off because it's like that driver has no idea what's going on. <laughs> it's almost, I guess you could kind of compare it to when you think about it. We've all probably have encountered a serial killer in our lives at some point and we don't even realize it. <laughs> it's like, here's a guy who just drove this dude to this house. Yeah, essentially the, his death. The, 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 yeah. Right. And basically you're seeing him for the last time and who knows what that conversation in the car is. If they even have a conversation. Right. I mean, because you know you're really not supposed to talk about it, or the guy could think, oh, this dude's a wacko. Yeah. <laughs> Some kind of exorcist home girl. <laughs> <What's he talking laughs> <about>? <laughs> you know. Unusual. But, but it, 
you know, it was one of those things where if you appreciate art, you can see a sense of everything. You know, there is a sense of romance in the scene with the way the lighting and the structure and what's he looking at? Is that light really like even though it's something ominous up there, but it's a almost like a heavenly looking beam coming down. And it's coming down on the guy who's essentially there to save the girl. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because he's a dark figure when he arrives. When in Iraq, he was in all white or tan. That's interesting. You know, which yeah. is actually like a real funny thing. Because I had heard Freakin' had a thing for the different colors. Color and choices. The, yeah. yeah. That's powerful. So I thought that was interesting too. Like maybe the light is, like he got away to Iraq to get this light. But he seemed like he lost some faith. But he kind of has to go back to a dark place to get his faith back and to restore faith and not just the mom, not just the girl, but in Father Karras as well. It's kind of like, I guess you could say like a little bit of evil goes a long way is is how it is. But yeah, I got to say that's probably like my favorite image and it's almost like a, it's on now. Yeah, You know, you got all these questions, all these, what are we doing? What do we try? Well, now you, you break out the big guns and it comes in such a dramatic fashion that you just feel it like something's going to change. Just like how you were saying with the Reagan, is my daughter going to die? <laughs> yeah. No. Like to me, that is the turning point mm-hmm. more than anything. Yeah. And that's, and that's what starts the, is my daughter going to die? No. No. So... But as all you guys said, between the sets, the lighting, the writing, I mean, there are some questions, but I don't know if that's because of symbolism reasons, Mm -hmm. maybe why questions are raised. But what makes this movie special to me is no matter what they do, I don't think there'll ever be another movie about the devil besides a documentary from somebody who has actually seen him or dealt with him. Unless it is actually Jesus Christ himself, right? That'll talk about him, <sighs> and not Pazuzu. <laughs> this, this, well, 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 I haven't written my life story. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh... I mean, there have been so many Exorcist movies that have come out in the last couple of years. They don't even hold a candle to this movie. This is no. the Jaws of the Exorcist mm-hmm. movies. They've tried because they think it's all about the possession. When no, this movie goes even more about like it's we've been talking about faith. Well, yeah, the, the and other, the build up. The other thing is, I know when I first started hearing about this movie, I was. I was little, and I've always had a thing for knowing your enemy. And a lot of times growing up, my mom and dad didn't have advice about what exactly the devil is. And then this movie I find out about, and it's talking about possessing a kid. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm a kid. You know, so like the ultimate evil can just come in and take you over. Anybody, yeah. And like what kind of torture is that? It's... You know, it it raises a lot of questions and it makes you go, you know, maybe I should look into this a little more and Mm -hmm. be aware of my enemy and how to defeat Mm -hmm. him. Whether it's your belief, whether it's what you choose to believe, that's up to you. But it definitely is a movie that does bring awareness and the end message is having the faith will restore faith in you and bring you back. Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. Nothing. No, he's just he's just here to listen. <laughs> so, honestly, like even with all the amount that it sparked, like even they did the TV show that took place almost thirty years later. That's mm-hmm. right, they did and, that. Like it did show that yeah, eventually Reagan is still going to be involved. Like Pazuzu is. <laughs> God, I'm <just> saying <laughs> still going to come after her because it, it essentially just wanted her because she was the one that got away. And mm-hmm. truthfully, it's like there's no matter how many Exorcist movies, no matter possession movies, like this will be the original. It'll actually hold to it. It's gonna. It has everything. Yeah, there, there, there's. It does. As funny as it sounds, there's some comedy moments. There's even love story in it. You yeah. know, there's mm-hmm. there's horror. There's laughter, and at the very end, like as you guys said, you can get out and go. Oh, yeah, yes. it's over. If you can make it through, because this movie is not yes. the faint of heart. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and it's like I can see why Kane Hodder said this is probably one of his favorite movies too. So absolutely, honestly, it holds up. It, it's a go-to movie for sure. Every Halloween, if you don't know what to watch, yeah. 
Okay, I'll say something. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about the the movie, how it builds up and it's very tightly wound. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned before the show, it had won the the writing Oscar. Right. Yeah, and it won an Oscar for sound. Oh yeah, yeah. We, did? we we didn't talk much about the sound or the soundtrack to this movie. But, I mean, well, I mean, like there's, a, there's there's a lot of briefly. like like very good use of sound effects. But I mean, as far as music, he only used music for like transitional scenes. Mm-hmm. Very limited, almost like the Alien vibe with Ridley Scott. Like, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. He cut a lot of Jerry Goldsmith's music for that movie, and it didn't need music. music really? It didn't really need music. No, which is odd because usually you've. It, it's like a mood killer and it really yeah like, slows the pace down but there's that, just that iconic theme and... but mu- music helps tell you how to feel during mm-hmm. the film or scene and the, the lack of it kind of leaves you open which almost makes an audience feel even more paranoid yeah it's like i don't know what i should be thinking at yeah. this point in time right. because there is nothing telling me other than exactly what i'm seeing i have no other mm-hmm. indication yeah and I want to be the first person to say after almost an hour, the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> wow, I didn't even realize none of us said that. No one no said that. No one said that. How long is it going to take before somebody says that? Yeah. But, but we oh. say Pazuzu how many times? <laughs> <laughs> we said like what, 20 times? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Father, Father, Father Marin and Karis do say the power of Christ compels you. I think it's 14 times in the movie. 14, 14, 14 times. 14 times. Yes. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Oh, that's it? <laughs> that's it, yeah. You'd think it'd be more. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's like, a, how many times did uh, Kim Basinger scream in Batman? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I guess that's the next countdown. <laughs> um, does anybody else have anything to contribute? Or is that a wrap on the episode? Yeah, that might be a wrap. Yeah, All right. That sounds good. Uh, Lord Damien, would you like to tell everybody how to catch you again on the um, show? Sure. Again, the TV show that I, I'm running now is called Damien's Dreadfuls. Uh, I post my episodes up on YouTube. Uh, if you go to the YouTube username is... Uh, is Lord Damien McDonovan, all one word. Uh, you can check out my Facebook, uh, Damien McDonovan also. Uh, my Twitter and Instagram account is at Lord underscore McDonovan. Um, I, I put out a new episode every month. Uh, I've been trying to do some uh, movie reviews between episodes also. Uh, but uh, my YouTube page has a ton of old episodes, some that Colin has actually helped me work on in the I past. Have. Uh, we did some uh, ma- some, some movie marathons uh, for a couple of years for uh, RCN Cable, uh, but now the which has now evolved into my own actual show, not owned by RCN, so I can do whatever the hell I want with it. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, def- definitely check that out. Check me out on on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, you know hit share and subscribe or whatever you guys do. Some more iconic horror films we'll get to. Sounds excellent. Yeah. We appreciate it. Well, thank we you. appreciate thank you showing up today. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for for inviting me. Thank you for having me. It's a it's a bit late for me now that it's you know the middle of the afternoon. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll cover some, you up. I'll outside. I'll get some sleep in soon. That's fine. <laughs> I just have to grab my very very black umbrella as I walk out. To the <laughs> all right, everybody. That wraps our podcast for this episode of The Exorcist. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll talk to you again soon. Uh, please, somebody help me!